Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Mitchell Ringos. Police have arrested 170 people over the past two days as officers moved in to clear the Freedom Convoy demonstrators off Wellington Street for the first time in three weeks. Annie Bergeron Oliver has the latest from Ottawa. Within minutes, the situation changed. Police pushing protesters back, attempting to gain ground they couldn't yesterday. Are you going to trap us? As rows of police advanced in the most forceful way yet, protesters quickly moved back. Police say they stepped up enforcement using helmets and batons for their safety after they say protesters exhibited aggressive and assaultive behavior. Our officers continued to face resistance. At one point, a flare was ignited by a protester. Officers used a chemical irritant, also known as pepper spray, to disperse unlawful demonstrators who were resisting police orders. Back up! Move! Move! Move. Wellington, once the heart of the convoy protest, where stages were erected and parties held, now taken back by police. That the only reason that this is being characterized as an occupation is because people stayed here, and the only reason people stayed here is because nobody would dialogue with them. As officers, the mounted unit and armoured vehicles moved closer to Parliament. Trucks that had been parked for four weekends started pulling out. One by one, the big rigs left. Why are you leaving? <laughs> Dozens more were arrested today, their trucks seized and some towed. Saturday, Canada. We will hold the line for our children and the future generations. Convoy organizers have now called on supporters to pull out. The police brought the violence. To that end, as a movement, we have chosen to peacefully withdraw from the streets of Ottawa. Ottawa's police chief said the force has made important progress in what he called a large and complex operation. But while many protesters have left, some vow their fight is not yet over. Annie Bergeron Oliver, CTV News, Ottawa. On Thursday, members of the Kenora Community Street Crime Unit, Treaty 3 Police Service and several specialist bureaus executed multiple search warrants as a result of a four-month investigation called Project Fenshaw. This, uh, this purpose of this project was to dis distribute the drug trafficking network in the city of Kenora and surrounding area. A number of items were seized in Project Fenshaw, including two motor vehicles, cell phones, over $110,000 worth of cocaine, morphine pills, cash, and trafficking paraphernalia. Police arrested and charged 63-year-old Lord Nee McGiffin with possession for the purpose of trafficking. Additionally, 55-year-old Barry Harper was charged with multiple drug-related offenses. And 65-year-old Leah Cameron was also charged for possession for the purpose of trafficking. Those two individuals were both released on conditions. The investigation remains ongoing. The tourism sector in Thunder Bay is expected to uh, continue its gradual recovery this year, but is still suffering heavy losses. That was one of the takeaways at this week's City Council meeting, which saw a presentation from Tourism Thunder Bay. Uh, when looking at 2021, the tourism industry bounced back to about 60% of pre-pandemic levels. Many of the concerns this past year revolved around a lack of U.S. travelers due to the pandemic restrictions. Americans usually made up around one-third of the yearly visitors pre-pandemic. And Tourism Thunder Bay manager Paul Pepe provided the update to Council and says part of the recovery will come from future marketing, which now has a strong focus format. We are across Ontario. We're into Manitoba. Uh, we're into the U.S. Midwest with, uh, with Facebook, with Instagram, um, with uh, YouTube. Uh, sponsored content and video and ads as well. So uh, we've got a number of commercials. If you watch the Scotties, uh, you know, we produced a number of video pieces for uh, distribution uh, in those channels that also did play into uh, uh, paid uh, sponsored social media as well. So we're doing much what other cities are doing here. We're doing the same thing in those markets. The city is looking forward to the arrival of the newest Viking cruise vessel coming to the city in 2022 to hopefully assist with the tourism recovery. It is expected to make seven overnight port calls starting in late May, bring over 500,000 visitors throughout the city.
Meanwhile, City Council has officially voiced its opposition to the province of Quebec's Bill 21. The legislation prohibits public servants, including teachers, police officers and judges from wearing religious symbols. The vote was unanimous at this week's City Council meeting and it adds Thunder Bay to a growing list of municipalities taking this stand. The recommendation was brought forward by the City's Anti-Racism and Respect Advisory Committee, which also saw a unanimous vote to bring it to Council. Mayor Bill Morrow recently supported a similar motion by Ontario's big city mayors in December and hopes this decision can help make an impact. And so the movement is, uh, of course, to see what's possible and encourage perhaps the federal government, at the least, to take this on and challenge the decision made by Quebec uh, as a province. It's in di direct contradiction uh, with the Human Rights Code. The City Council decision means the City will send a letter to the federal government urging them to challenge Bill 21 in court. The number of active fire halls in Greenstone has decreased by one following the closure earlier this year of the Caramant Fire Hall. It comes amid discussions of provincially mandated training requirements for many small towns that use volunteer firefighting model. And as Adam Riley explains, those changes could be financially unbearable for some. Residents of Karamat will have to rely on nearby Long Lac for fire protection from now on, following a decision to close Greenstone's easternmost wards fire hall due to a low roster, which had been whittled down to one active member. Deputy Mayor Jamie McPherson says with the closure and a longer distance now for first responders, the municipality will be taking a proactive approach to minimize the number of calls for service. We're going to be expediting education for the for the residents and the members of that community on, on fire prevention so that we can, we do our best to minimize the risk that they may feel. The equipment at the Karamat Hall will be redistributed to where it will be best put to use in the municipality, which has four other fire halls. However, things are about to get complicated for those remaining four halls. The province is proposing mandatory training and certification requirements for firefighters, which became a major topic of discussion at Council Monday evening. It was there Greenstone CAO Mark Wright laid out the hard facts. The training will be expensive. Even if we can grandfather, so to speak, half of our department, um, we're talking 78 to 80 firefighters that there is regularly, um, I'll call it churn, but regularly people turning over, new people coming in, people leaving. And so we'll be seeing a constant need to train. The current roster of firefighters for all of Greenstone is 7 in Beardmore with a vacancy of 12, a full complement of 25 in Geraldton, 10 current and 9 positions open in Nikina, and Long Lack rounds out with 15 active members with 4 spots free on the roster. McPherson says each station should have a minimum of 15 members, the same amount of firefighters for a municipality the size of Belleville. Yet we don't have that population, so the expectation that's being placed on us is that we have to train these people to the standards that they're looking towards. We don't know how to do that. Financially, it's over six figures. McPherson says most municipalities in the Northwest will be in a similar situation as Greenstone, and he's hoping those communities and the Northwestern Ontario Municipal Association will be able to provide lobbying support with the province. We're not looking for full-time, and they're there as volunteers. They don't want it to be a full-time job. So therefore, what can we do to make this work? The province is now taking comments from municipalities for guidance on this proposal until the end of the month. Adam Riley, TBT News. The Northwestern Ontario Aviation Heritage Centre has had a challenging time navigating the pandemic. But with the recent changes in restrictions, aircraft history fans and the general public can once again check out everything the facility has to offer. Board member Denise Lison says the nonprofit center on Victoria Avenue depends on people coming in. So in order to pay the rent, they've had to rely on government COVID subsidies and charity funds from Superior Shores Gaming. The center managed to open a few times during the pandemic on Wednesdays and Sundays, but it had to close again during the Omicron wave. The facility is now back open to visitors, but only by appointment. The center features many displays of local aviation history and even a virtual flight simulator. And Lizen says she's happy the public can once again come see the exhibits. We tried to focus a lot more on specific stories that are happening. So it's not just a bunch of reading and, and that we're trying to make it a little more interactive and a little more interesting, I guess, for the general purpose. Not everybody likes airplanes, but a lot of people like history.
Anyone wishing to have a tour can call or send an email so arrangements can be made for a preferred day and time. Con contact info is available on the group's website or their Facebook page. Lizen says she's hoping the center will be able to open with regular hours sometime in March. The Family Day weekend got off to a great start at the Fort William Historical Park as dozens of locals enjoyed a variety of winter activities. Alex, Alex Flood has the details. You couldn't have asked for better conditions as the Fort William Historical Park had a successful opening to the Family Day weekend. Visitors had the chance to take part in solar viewing or listen to Indigenous storytelling and the Thunder Bay Museum was also on site to provide visitors with some fun activities and demonstrations. The most popular attraction was the tubing hill as kids enjoyed taking a steep and exhilarating ride down to the bottom. Patrick Morash, the GM of the Fort William Historical Park, is thrilled with their start to the long weekend. The day is going great. We had a bit of a slow start because I think uh, a lot of people woke up and saw that there was a pretty nasty wind chill. Uh, but now that uh, most people have lunch behind them, the sun's out and it's beautiful out here today. Tubing is just one of the many activities being held this weekend at the Fort William Historical Park. And we had the chance to talk to some kids about how much fun they're having going down the hill. It's um, really warm. It's really great out here. I'm having a fun time outside. Um, right now I'm currently going down the tube sledding hill. What's your favorite part about uh, going down the hill? Uh, that one of them spins me and I go super far. Who usually wins the race between the two of you? Uh, Carter, because I, I normally scream and like try and stop it. Yeah. If you missed out on visiting the historical park today, not to worry, as activities will be running from 11 in the morning to 5 in the evening on Sunday and Monday. Tickets can be purchased on site for just $5, and children 5 and under are free. Alex Flood, TBT News. And now joined by sports anchor Kurt Black. Now, Kurt, not the only fun. Alex had some fun on the ice, but I hear there's some more fun that is ice-related. Yeah, that's right, Mitch. A champion has been crowned in the t -Bay Tell Major League of Curling. We'll have all the highlights from Port Arthur Curling Club right after the break. <laughs> 